Hey guys, today we're at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And today we're gonna see the Mars Rover. Look, it's right here. We're gonna meet some people here and then ask them questions about the Mars Rover and even a Mars helicopter. Hey guys, today we're here with Anais. Hi! Hey. She's a system engineer that works on the Mars rover right behind us. Wow, look how big it is. Foreign object detected. It's humongous. Yeah, we're gonna ask her some questions about the Mars rover. What is the mission for the Mars rover to go to Mars? We have this mission, the Perseverance mission, to search for signs of ancient life on Mars. So the last mission we sent up, Curiosity, was trying to prove that life could exist on Mars. It was looking for all the right ingredients for life to start, happen, and we proved that it could. Life can exist on Mars. This mission is going to look for signs of those types of life that could have existed, maybe tiny little organisms that may have had, like been there billions of years ago. Have you found any signs of life? Not yet, we're working on it. So how long has the Mars rover been on Mars at this point? Perseverance has been on Mars since February of 2021. Our last rover, Curiosity, yeah. has been there since 2012. So we're coming up on almost 10 years on that So one. that Curi Curiosity rover, it's still on Mars? Still on Mars, still driving around, yep. Oh, wow. wow. And what about this one? Uh, is it exactly the same as the one in the Mars? Not quite. It's close, but there are some differences. On Mars, the Perseverance rover is powered by a nuclear power source that oh. sits in its RTG. It's called, it's called an RTG. It stands for Radio Isotope Thermoelectric Generator. And that plutonium power source sits in the back of the rover where this big white box is. We're standing this close to the rover. There's obviously no plutonium power source in there. So this rover gets all of its power from this umbilical cable that goes back in the shed and connects to power supplies. It's another big difference is that this rover doesn't have any radios. All of the data, and when we talk to this rover, goes through that same long black umbilical cable back here. On Mars, though, we don't have a cable sticking right. out of the rover. <laughs> so we have radios to talk to it. So we'll talk to the rover using its high gain antenna, which is sitting right there on top of the rover. It's that hexagonal shaped thing. It's kind of hard to see because it's laying flat and facing up right now. And then we have our ultra high frequency antenna, which is that black cylinder sitting back there. And so that, when the rover collects all its data throughout the day, it will store that data. And then when an orbiter flies overhead, over, you know, over the sky where the rover is, it'll use that antenna to beam all its data up to the orbiter. And then that orbiter sends it back down to us on Earth. Why is it called the Mars rover? Call the rover because it roves. You can send different kinds of spacecraft to Mars. One of those types of spacecraft is a lander, which will just land and it'll stay where it is. A rover has wheels and can drive around. So we rove around Mars and that's why it's called a rover. Do you know how fast it goes? Yes, I do. It goes 0 0.01 miles per hour. It goes really, really slow. Wow. wow. <laughs> so it, it, it goes, goes slow. Faster than that. Yeah. <laughs> it goes slow because these wheels are designed to have really high torque, so you can basically grip onto the rocks you're driving over uh -huh. and have a lot of traction. But you also don't want to move too fast because what if you run into something or go somewhere you don't want to go? We want to be extra careful. So that's why. We so if the rover just happened to fall over, can it pick themselves? Can it pick itself back up? We try really hard to keep that from happening. <laughs> no, it couldn't pick itself back up unless we got really creative with the robotic arm. But no, that's typically not a case we play for. We try really hard to let that not happen. Right. It's on so board it does camp. have an arm. It has an arm and the arm has a shoulder. It has an elbow. It has a wrist. Oh. And at the end of this wrist are all of the instruments. It has a camera. It has a drill. It can take that drill can core samples out of rocks right. and store them in little test tubes. We could do really? a lot with a robotic arm, yeah. How long does it take to get to Mars? So for these rovers, it takes about eight to nine months to get to Mars from the time we launch to the time we launch. Whoa. It's really far away. So I know it takes a lot to to make one of these rovers. Mm -hmm. How long did it take? To make the actual rover that we sent to Mars, from the time someone had the idea that yeah. we want to build the rover, 
up until launch is somewhere about 10 years. Wow. Because wow. you decide that you want to build a rover, but then there are all these questions. What is this rover going to do? What does it need to fulfill its mission? What instruments do we need to put on it? What mechanisms does it need? After that, after you decide what it needs, you're going to have to design everything. You design everything on paper and then you build it. And now you have all these parts. And then you have to put all these parts together, right? Kind of like a yeah. whole Lego set. You got to take all of these individual pieces, plug them in, and then make sure it works. And that's, that's my job, basically. I plug everything in and make sure it works. <laughs> after all of that testing is done, and you've built the whole thing, then you launch it. Wow. And that takes that takes about 10 years. It's a really long time. And does the software drive the uh, rover on its own? Or does somebody have to control it? It can. You can do both. Because Mars is so far away, you have a time delay, right? From the time you send a signal here to by the time it gets to Mars, it takes anywhere from 7 minutes to 12 minutes, oh, depending really? on where Earth and Mars are relative to each other. So with that kind of delay, you can't really drive the rover around like you would in a video game. You can't like Mario Kart this thing around. <laughs> there are a couple different ways to drive the rover. Either we know exactly what the terrain in front of us looks like and the, we call them rover planners down here on Earth. They're essentially the rover drivers. We'll send a sequence of commands to tell the rover where to go. Okay, drive five meters forward, then turn right here, then drive another meter and make a slight left, right? Exact instructions and directions on where to go. Or if you want to drive really long distances, maybe you don't necessarily know what the terrain in front of you looks like 20 meters, 30 meters out, or maybe even 100 meters out. So what you want the rover to do then is you're going to give it a goal. You're going to say, I want you to drive all the way here, 100 meters away. And the rover will start taking pictures. And from those pictures, it can identify rocks in its way and drive around them. So oh, wow. it, it can so drive on its own, yeah. yeah. Does, is there any downtime to the rover? Does it need time to just rest and, re and recharge? Yes, absolutely. So the rover, at a certain point, it runs from about, let's say, Mars time, like 9 a.m. to about 3 p.m. There are Got some it. things you can wake it up in the middle of the night to do, but after it's done for its, you know, done its all its work for the day, it will go to sleep to recharge its batteries. Also, another reason we kind of like to rest is because Mars is so cold. It gets so cold at night that a lot of our mechanisms and instruments can't operate in that temperature range. It gets too cold for them. So it's better for us to operate during the day right. when there's sun and light and we can take pictures and everything's happy and at the right temperature. Yeah. All right, so I actually have to run off and go back to work, but Elio's going to come here and answer some more of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We learned so much so far. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Hi guys, now we're here with Elio, which is also another hey. system engineer. Hi. Hi! Hey guys, nice meeting you. How do you know the rover's gonna work on Mars if you built it on Earth? That's a great question. So we have to test a lot to make Ooh. sure things work when we get to Mars. We have to be prepared for that. So there's a lot of testing that goes into that, a lot of thinking. Things don't always work. So many times we fail in those tests and we have to figure out why did things fail, right? Diagnose those problems, right? If something doesn't go your way, you want to know why, learn from it and move on. So I see this Mars yard over here, but what is it for? Yeah, so the Mars yard we use primarily to learn how to navigate with the rover on Mars. So the rover on Mars gets to move around mostly on its own as to, okay, I'm going to go from point A to point B. There's all these rocks in the way. What's the best way to move around those rocks? So that's what we try and test around here and we build all these obstacles so that the rover learns how to do that and we learn how it works. Is there a certain perimeter that the rover knows to stay around or is just exploring the whole Mars? We have to make decisions here on Earth, right? The scientists say these regions look very interesting for one reason or another. These rocks, we want to go look at them for a reason. The scientists and the engineers collaborate on where we want to move on next. Mm -hmm. And then we tell the rover, okay, go from this point to this other point. So on the rover, I see like a giant head part. What is that for? Yeah, so the rover's head or the remote sensing mast mm -hmm. has several instruments on it. And what it allows us to do is to point and look around the surrounding of the rover. We have several cameras that mm -hmm. aid that mobility, right? What I was talking about, the rover navigating on its own, mm -hmm. the cameras that do most of that work that help us see what's around are on that head. Not only that, there's also a really powerful laser that helps us also what? look at what the rocks are made of. Instead of unloading or unstowing the robotic arm and doing all these complex operations, we can see what's 
you know, what are these rocks made of first? Mm -hmm. And then determine whether they're interesting enough. A lot of those beautiful images that you guys see, yeah. panoramas that we get down on Earth, they're taken with the head. Is the rover in Mars eventually come back to Earth or they, it stays? No, the rovers on Mars get to stay there. There's no plans to bring them back. Uh -huh. I mean, who knows hundreds of years from now what people decide to do with them. <laughs> what is really cool about this mission is that we are preparing for Mars sample return, mm -hmm. something we've never done, right. right? So if we find something that's going to be interesting enough, uh -huh. a rock that has materials that we're curious about, uh -huh. we're going to collect those samples. The following mission is going to go pick them up uh -huh. and bring them back to Earth. So there is there like a like a home base where they're collecting all these rock samples and putting it back into the same place every time? Not quite. Uh, we are collecting the samples yeah. and storing them in the rover. Oh, inside it, the rover. Yeah, and then eventually we will have to deposit them somewhere mm -hmm. so that they can be picked up by yeah. another rover. Why is there a black plaque with like a snake and then the world on it? Great question. We put that plaque on the rover. We managed to launch the mission during, you know, the the peak of, of, of COVID, we have to thank all those people that helped out. And to honor them, we put a plaque on the rover that is also on the Mars rover to commemorate them and to thank the doctors and all of the first responders that have helped with COVID. Does the storage ever fill up if it takes too much pictures? So that's a great question. We have a computer that does have to be cleared up over time because yeah, we're limited just as we are with our phone. Does it also take videos? That's right, yes. We yeah. have also been taking videos. It's something we've done for the first time with this rover. Uh -huh. Along with the video, there's also yeah. a microphone. So oh. we can capture some sound on the yeah. There's less air there, so we can't hear quite as well as we would hear and we would listen to things here on Earth. A new way of looking of, uh, you know, the right. Martian surface. What was the most challenging difference between Earth and Mars, the environmental difference? So there are key differences with Mars and Earth. Some of that includes gravity, right? So right. gravity on yeah. Mars is about a third of what it is here. So if you weigh 100 pounds on Earth, you'll weigh about 33 pounds well, That means Mars. we can jump So you jump may be able really to high. jump a little fat, a little higher. You may be able to move a little easier, a little faster. Ooh. But also Mars is really cold. So Mars can be up to negative 100 Celsius. So wow. um, it's pretty cold. The rover has a heating system. It can, oh. uh, just like us, right? How our body regulates our heat throughout our body or through our blood and our circulatory system. There's something similar on the rover. Compared to Earth, there's about 1% atmosphere. So way less air. The atmosphere is composed primarily of carbon dioxide. Oh. Here on Earth, oh. it's mostly nitrogen, oxygen, things we yeah. as humans have we can't survive. breathe. So we wouldn't be able to breathe on Mars, oh. right? So it's a very different composition in the atmosphere. It can be windy, but the winds there are fast, but you wouldn't feel them as strong as you would feel them here on Earth. Thank you for answering our questions. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, we nice learned so much you. too. Cool. Appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you. Hey guys, today we're here with Teddy, and he is the operation lead of the Mars helicopter. And we're going to ask him some questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for coming here to JPL. What does Operation Lead do? So we have a team here at NASA JPL working day to day to prepare the plans for Ingenuity Mars helicopter, send those commands up to Perseverance, the rover, and, and run our missions. We then get our data back, process that data, make sure it looks good and prepare our, our future flights. And this helicopter, this is the helicopter? In terms of size, this is the full size of what you would yeah. see on the surface of Mars. The real Mars helicopter has a solar panel on top. Wow. That's how it charges every day. That's how it gets its energy. Why is it so small? Mars helicopter needed to fit inside the belly of the rover, oh. underneath Perseverance. So we had a, a small volume to work with. But another reason that it's small is because it needs to be very light. So you move your hands around here on Earth, you can feel the hairs on your arm, you know, moving around because of the air hitting that. On Mars, you have 1% that. So it's very, very thin air. So because of that, Mars helicopter needs to be very light. So what is the purpose of the Mars helicopter? The entire purpose of our mission is to prove that we can fly on Mars. That's it. Ah. We are a technology demonstrator. I'm proud to say, and the whole team here uh, at NASA JPL is proud to say that we've accomplished our mission. Wow. 
nice. Does it capture any footage or takes any pictures? Yeah, we have two cameras on board. Uh, they're located right here in the front. Oh. Uh, one of them points down and uh -huh. takes pictures of the ground. That's okay. how the helicopter sees where it's flying. And then we have another one that's very similar to a cell phone camera, right? Oh. Uh, kind of like a forward looking or like a selfie camera. Yeah. And we use that camera. It's also here in the front uh -huh. and it points uh, towards the front a little bit. And that's how we can take really beautiful uh, color images of the Martian landscape. How high can that helicopter go up and how fast can it go? Um, we've been keeping our heights above the ground five meters, 10 meters. And how long can it fly for? Ultimate maximums around, you know, two and a half, three minutes, thereabouts. So I noticed this is wrapped in a gold foil. Is mm -hmm. that any purpose for that? Great question. So that foil, it's, it's, it's to trap all of our heat inside. I see. Right, inside of this box here is where we have all of our electronics mm -hmm. and also our batteries. And when we have heat in there, it's like, you can think of it like a blanket. Mm -hmm. It's just a thermal blanket to keep all that heat in for as long as possible. How are you guys controlling this the helicopter? All autonomously. On the surface of Mars, it's too far away to have any sort of pilot in the loop. It takes you know about 14 minutes to have any sort of round trip signal. By the time you make a change on the joystick, you've already crashed. Ingenuity Mars helicopter, it's given a set of instructions mm -hmm. and it just follows those instructions one right after the next. So we'll say take off, climb to you know 15 feet off the ground, mm -hmm. and then fly to a waypoint, fly to a waypoint, come back down and land. And that instruction list is all executed on its own autonomously from flight to flight. So how much does the helicopter weigh? Right around four pounds. How do you guys test this one? The best way to test an aircraft is, is in the closest environment you can get. Now the closest to Mars we can get here on Earth is right up the hill. Uh, we really? have a, a test chamber here at JPL. You could think of it like a, like a big soda can, mm -hmm. um, 25 feet in diameter, uh, several stories tall. And that is our little space chamber. You can simulate outer space, you can simulate the surface of Mars, anything you want. So what kind of sound does it make? Does it make any sound? Yes, uh, <laughs> it makes a lot of sound. And it, it makes a loud, like a burring noise uh, uh, when you're standing next to it, in the, you know, outside the chamber. On the surface of Mars, it's gonna sound different because the atmosphere is different. Why are the propellers stacked on top of each other? One of the reasons we went for this design is to keep the, the overall volume small, mm -hmm. right? So, so we, we stack the two blades on top, get more lift, and we don't have to have the space of a tail now that we need to accommodate underneath the rover. How long did it take for you guys to come up with the initial concept and design to it being functional, ready to take off? The initial concept got started in the early 90s. Oh my, wow, I did not know that. Ago. Yeah, so our <laughs> chief engineer, uh, Bob Ballaram, started sketching out the idea, held on to it until the technology advanced long enough. Now that you guys have proven that it can fly on Mars, what is the next step? Now that we've successfully, you know, checked off that box, right? <laughs> Humanity can fly on Mars. And now our main focus is pushing the envelope even, even further. What else can we do? What other lessons can we learn for future generations of prototypes? Right. Mm -hmm. And how can we be useful to the rover team? But also learn lessons for ourselves in terms of running the team, how to make that process more streamlined for the future. Thank you, Teddy, for answering all our questions. Thank you for your interest in Mars Helicopter. Appreciate Thank you, you guys. so yeah. much. Thank you so much Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for watching our video, and I hope you learned a lot about the Mars rover. Remember, always stay happy and rise up. Bye! Bye.